stars. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at IBM. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Please join us after the webinar for a guided meditation session with Casey Lane. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from IBM, Michael Curry. Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Curry. I am Vice President of Products for IBM Watson Health. And today I'm here to moderate a very distinguished panel of um, professionals in the healthcare industry to talk to you a little bit about digital transformation and sort of what's happening around um, the investments that everybody's been making in interoperability and where the industry is kind of heading after these initial set of mandates have been rolled out because we're right here at the deadline and we're seeing um, you know, that first phase get in, into implementation. So it's interesting to kind of talk to some leaders about what, what's next and, and how they're viewing that investment. So hopefully we'll have a great discussion today. So joining me today are um, three uh, eminent um, uh, experts in the field. We've got Dahlia Powers from Humana. I don't know if you guys saw on the initial uh, screen, for some reason it was the wrong uh, company that uh, was listed, but Dahlia is from, joins us from Humana. Uh, we have Hamanshu Aurora from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. And we have Jeff Ribkin with one eye, not two eyes. Apologies for the uh, misspelling uh, from IDC. So there's a little bit of quality control issue on really cool little um, uh, avatars there for us, but unfortunately the names were a little messed up. So apologies for that, but uh, we've got a great team on here and we'll kick off the discussion in a minute, but I wanted to give each of the uh, panelists an opportunity just to quickly introduce themselves and give a little background on their focus and and what they're doing within their organizations. So um, let's start with Dahlia. Dahlia, you wanna, wanna get started? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So thanks for having me here and uh, really excited about this panel. So Dahlia Powers uh, uh, with Humana, I'm Senior Vice President and CTO of Product Innovation Experience. Uh, basically my organization is responsible for product engineering as well as the experience uh, build out for the digital health and analytics across Humana. Uh, I actually celebrated one e my one year anniversary with Humana and in healthcare in the middle of June of this year. Uh, prior to Humana, my experience was in technology organizations, starting with IBM uh, a long time ago and Dell EMC, then I stepped into financial services uh, for a few years before uh, coming into healthcare with Humana. Excited to be here. Great, thanks. I appreciate you uh, joining us, Dahlia. And then Himanshu, do you wanna go next? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. Himanshu Arora. I serve as the Chief Data Analytics Officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Um, there, I oversee all of our company's investments in um, advanced analytics, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of the emerging disruptive disciplines. And part of my role is in the transformation function. The other part of it is in the here and now, the operations part of it. And interoperability is a topic that sort of goes across both. So I'm very uh, happy to be here to talk about that. Um, and my association with IBM goes way back, but more recently I also um, serve on the IBM Watson advisory panel for um, healthcare. We very much appreciate that Himanshu. So <laughs> good to see you. And uh, Jeff, why don't you give a quick intro yourself? Hi, Michael, I'm Jeff Rifkin. I'm the research director of the payer practice at IDC Health Insights. IDC has 1,100 analysts all over the world uh, doing research and advisory services and writing reports that are that people can subscribe to. Um, I've been doing this for about six years. Before that, I was enterprise architect at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield of Maryland, DC, and Virginia. And before that, was an uh, architect at Magellan Health. Had some experience with Verizon, Accenture, various other things in 40 years of IT. Uh, IDC has, like I said, 1,100 analysts all over the world. And luckily I get to study the 300 vendors and about 900 health plans that are using that technology. And I'm looking forward to this conversation, Michael. It's uh, IBM, Health, IBM Watson Health is a, a fine organization. Looking forward to having this uh, interactive discussion with these experts in the field. Great, thanks Jeff. And anybody who uh, gets a chance, you should read Jeff's work. He does some wonderful reports out there. So um, let me go ahead and get started. So the, the key 
uh, focus for this conversation is really about you know what's what's next right what's happening um, beyond the mandates the initial um rollout of the mandates obviously we've all been charging to the finish line here but now there's a new finish line set up for the next wave and uh it's interesting to kind of talk to different organizations about how they view the investment that has been made in interoperability and kind of how that's changing things internally so let me get started with a, a quick question just to, about how far you've gone and, and how you're looking at this are you guys thinking about the initial wave of the um the cms mandates as just being something that you were where you're just doing a meets minimum just to to really kind of comply with the mandates are you really looking at this is something that will kick off a broader transformation across your organization. I'll start with uh, Himanshu. Let, maybe you can give me your perspective on that. Sure, uh, Michael, happy to. So the short answer is we are looking at it as a, a transformational, transformative strategic initiative. Uh, but quite frankly, for the here and now, there is a lot of compliance work that has been put in place as it rightly should be to give us a strong foundation. I think if we go back and look at the genesis of interoperability and related regulations, price transparency, et cetera, uh, you know, as I've said to some of our uh, senior leaders internally and, and externally, I tend to look at this as this is regulators and healthcare and other constituents giving us um, feedback, saying that the industry isn't moving fast enough in terms of empowering the consumer with the information they need to have greater control over an industry and a function that with passage of time, even though the technology component of it goes up, just becomes more and more complicated. It's inherent tendency of the industry, the entropy of it is to move towards complicated rather than simply simplified. So when you put back that backdrop onto it, you know, we are, we're just top of the first innings here, right? In terms of where, where all of this is headed uh, even if you take the seven and compliance date that's coming up, a lot of effort has been put into creating the structures around it. But really till we can empower, educate, guide counsel, the individuals, the members to ask for these services, right? And for the innovators, the disruptors, uh, the new entrants and the incumbents to start to create capabilities that really sort of starts to draw water from these pipes, if you will, Right. It, I expect it'll be a slow uptake or slower uptake up front than we might see, like more of a hockey stick uh, is, is what I expect and anticipate. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of cautiousness, uh, again, rightly so, both in terms of how do we, how do we manage the security, privacy of the data that we as payers have mm -hmm. been entrusted with. At the same time, how do we enable use cases that are really uh, you know, just uh, at the doorstep to be enabled through this. So, so we're, we're in the space where you know, most of us, many of us, all of us are in a compliance, uh, you know, we, we met the compliance or are about to meet the compliance aspect of it, uh, but the other aspects are up and coming. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, it's interesting to see, I think you're right, the consumer side of it really is going to impact how quickly the adoption happens. And, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the financial services industry. And I think, Dahlia, you did as well. And I think as, as we, it, it was very interesting parallels there. There were a lot of um, mandates around opening up, uh, you know, payment APIs and, and uh, information across the, within banking in a very similar way. And it took really the change happening at the consumer side to drive the change. But once it started to take hold, it completely transformed the industry. And I mean, we see now the consumerization happening on the banking side that never would have happened had not had those mandates not been put in place. So it really is a very interesting uh, perspective that, that consumers will drive the big wave of change. Dolly, are you seeing the same thing in Humana? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, we look at consumers um, uh, sometimes a little bit differently for retail as an example versus financial services versus healthcare. And rightfully so, there are um, differences in the type of data and, and sensitivity of data handled in different sectors. 
Um, but at the end of the day, sometimes it's the same person, the same consumer, and, and sometimes taking the harder step in one industry paves the way for accepting change and transformation in another industry. Um, as I look as an example at, at healthcare and the investments we've done uh, through last year and you know uh, with COVID, I think it helped us really accelerate our focus on investment uh, on a lot of transformative technologies, including you know um, machine learning, AI, and, and uh, public cloud. And those investments are really setting us up to be in a much stronger uh, uh, position when it comes to looking at um, things such as interoperability. Uh, as an example, um, uh, when uh, COVID started, we determined that a lot of our members, because a lot of our members are seniors, they have social determinants of health. And one prominent one was food insecurity, because they weren't going to be able to really step out and, 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 and satisfy some of their basic needs. And uh, the use of technology there really helped us. Uh, as an example, we targeted uh, some of our members that uh, were very vulnerable and delivered a million meals uh, at the beginning of, of COVID. Uh, and we continue to build on some of those investments in AI and machine learning and analytics uh, as we uh, step uh, more and more into uh, other spaces. I look at interoperability as um, you know, consumer mediated interoperability. And that's where the consumer and data privacy, as well as consent management is really critical. And we are making a lot of advancements in, in this area. Uh, but I would say we're probably in the crawl walk phase. <laughs> we're definitely not in the run phase just yet, but we're laying the foundation to get there, right? With some of the work that all of us uh, are, are um, uh, making in that space. There's also, of course, the data exchange aspect of interoperability that would be uh, also between uh, the different payers and providers. And I think putting the foundational elements in place uh, are really going to help us uh, take the next level as we think about interoperability and data exchange at a macro scale and, and looking at it uh, in the future. Uh, so I think um, this is just the beginning. Uh, we all probably have plans about what do we do after we meet the 7-1 uh, mandate. And the foundation we've built is going to be uh, uh, help us uh, leapfrog uh, into some, uh, developing some of our strategies and executing upon them. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear both of you say that you see this as a foundation, right? I think that was the purpose of the mandates to begin with is, to, you know, to really establish this as a baseline. Okay, now we're all sort of talking the same language in some ways and opening up um, the opportunity. <laughs> now, wh whether that opportunity is met and whether consumers adopt it and all that is still open, but I think that us all seeing it as the foundation really establishes a, an opportunity for us in the future to, to turn this into something bigger. And you also, Dahlia, you, you mentioned the um, social determinants. I, I, I actually think that's a huge part of this is, is creating those linkages and, and enabling us to um, act better on those um, opportunities to help people. I just read an, a, a study that said that um, people with unmet social needs are one and a half to 1.8 times more likely to go to have an emergency room visit in the next year. And so there's a, such a strong correlation between healthcare needs and um, you know, other social needs and, and being able to establish those connections, anticipate them, build programs to help, um, you know, to make sure that the access is there and to make sure that some of those unmet social needs are addressed is, is critical to fixing the overall healthcare system. So Jeff, are you seeing a similar thing across the board and uh, all of the payers you talk to? It's not across the board. I mean, I think it's it's fair to say, and again, all rec all recommendations and all all payer approaches are local and regional, and a function of the market share that they're competing against and another health number of health systems they're dealing with. But in general, um, the good news is that the interoperability mandates gave the excuse to have the organization get the money. Uh, a lot of times these sharing initiatives or these infrastructure initiatives or plumbing initiatives have some com some column or don't really get the the funding that's necessary to do good foundational work it's a great word foundational and so with the interoperability mandate the mandates money usually gets paid the pmo usually says yes that, that goes to the top of the list we get to get the money this year 
and then the good news is, is the organizations that are forward thinking have been using, you know, either enterprise architecture or some other PMO perspective that says, we're going to take this money and then add it to some consumer experience money and add it to some LOB money and add it to some security money and add it to some customer 360 money. And we're going to try to put together, you know, a data platform. Uh, the idea of a data 360 that allows the members to be understood as a whole person, uh, not just clinical administrative, you know, the merger of claims and clinical, but now bringing in social determinants, uh, maybe an, up, an upgraded sense of security and privacy and consent, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. The whole idea of infrastructure. And I sort of had this tendency, being an architect, I sort of look inside out. Um, and what this, having this money to be able to do the things like API libraries, um, platforms, cleansing, ingestion engines, rules engines, uh, MP, you know, all those things that are necessary to build a member 360 so you can have a core set of data that is used for the enterprise as well as the walls of the payer are sort of breaking down. You really don't have, you have silos inside but, and you also had silo alone as away from the providers and away from the other organizations. Now you have sort of virtual walls of data. You don't know who's gonna come get the data. You don't, you know, maybe you were involved in a health information exchange, maybe not. But if you, even if you were, you knew where you were gonna get send the data to because you were in this sort of hub and spoke situation. Now you got a situation where you got APIs open up data through third party apps and anybody can, anybody can write, anybody can use. And I, you know, I totally agree with my predecessors here that talked about the consumerism driving and what's the, the, the linchpin is gonna be those third party apps. And so we start seeing consumers using third party apps, which gets to the data. So we sort of end to end testing. That's when we'll see if this is really being adopted the same way you talked about in finance. The funny part is, uh, these third party apps have to sort of work from the standard and we're looking inside out as payers and say, okay, did we enable this data on the edge with a fire server? Yeah, we probably did. Uh, is the data we put out there good? I mean, is it the right data? Is, you know, is Jeff Rifkin's data, Jeff Rifkin across the country. I'm aware of three or four other Jeff Rifkin's in the country. Um, <laughs> sorry for them, but they, but they, you do, there are, that's a real problem, right? And we all understand it. Multi-year, multi-person kind of matching has to done, has to be done well. This data is going to be exposed to people, uh, and it better be right. And if it's not right, it's going to make you know, as we used to say, the front page. Uh, and that's that's you know, that's the fear we all have that um, you know we could sort of if we had you know it's, it's it's a little different than a breach. It's more of it's more of a, a trust problem. Like wow, you just messed my data up. What else have you messed up? And so a reputation is important here. And I don't, and I think we've sort of just, again, we are in the first inning. We, first of all, CMS isn't done. Uh, mm -hmm. CMS is going to, um, they're going to have more, you know, mandates. Yeah. They're going to be broader, <laughs> you know, that, well, that's what they do. Yep. And so this is, but is you can just see how this trajectory of other kinds of data, social determinants data, genomic data, remote monitoring data, this, you know, tsunami of data that payers have to be ready to respond quickly to ingest and cleanse and make accessible and make available about the member 360. So the long answer is member 360 is really what's happening because of interoperability. And the organizations that are using this money collected from all kinds of different places, now they have an excuse, are the ones that are gonna be successful. But there are plans, frankly, they're just checking the box so you don't get fined. Yeah, so that's really interesting. It raises a, a very interesting point. I mean, you know, if you really look at this, this is a data integration problem, right? And funny, because a lot of the clients that we, have been working with as they've in, implemented uh, interoperability, that's been the biggest challenge, right? Is bringing together data from across many different um, sources and, and dealing with the data quality issues and the alignment issues. And so, you know, this is a big investment in data integration and um, data cleansing and, and trying to pull everything together. Are, are you, I, I guess the, the question for, for the panelists here is, are you seeing this as the foundation of a new data architecture and that kind of member 360 approach? Uh, or is this really a sidecar that's specific to the regulation? So, I mean, I'm just curious as to how you guys are seeing it. Dahlia, how would you characterize it at Humana? Uh, I think Jeff must have been sitting in on some of our strategy <laughs> discussions. <laughs> was, I, was, I was smiling throughout his speech because it, I, he touched on uh, a lot of what uh, we've been talking about uh, even before I landed at Humana. So when we talk about um, uh, the member 360 view and um, we call it internally the longitudinal human record, which is basically we want to know all known data uh, about uh, a person and correlate it 
uh, obviously normalize, harmonize, make sure it's accurate, do identity matching. Uh, and then of course, uh, a lot of the focus on how do you secure that data? Because we talk about uh, uh, data breaches from retailers are very impactful or from financial services, but this is a, a human being's most sensitive data. So, uh, and actually I learned that on the black market, it costs a lot more to get data about healthcare than it does about financial services. So it's, it's going to be a very prime target for, uh, for uh, hackers and attackers as well. So, uh, so we wanna look uh, at how do we enable this functionality as well as how do we secure this data? Uh, and of course, uh, healthcare data, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's a huge, you know, big data problem, if, if you will. So um, definitely a lot of us are uh, looking at public cloud uh, type of uh, scale so that we can do an effective and efficient job of um, building our data platform. So we do have an enterprise data platform as well, where we do a lot of this work. Um, so, uh, so the security becomes uh, a very, a very uh, important de there, of course, um, as well as uh, how do we um, use this data to run our AI and machine learning on it. And with that, of course, we also have to think about uh, encryption and anonymization, all of those things that, so that our, the data even is not exposed to our internal associates. It's, it's very much um, secure. Uh, so we take that very seriously. And then um, the last thing I, I would uh, say is, of course, uh, how do we uh, make sure that it is accurate and good from a consumer perspective? Because as a consumer, um, if um, I get diagnosed with a terminal illness as an example, and then the next day you call me and you tell me, go get your health checkup uh, for, for a screening, it just really breaches that trust and experience. Uh, uh, that our consumers have with us. So uh, it's around how do you have your uh, data connected so your omni-channel experience is consistent as well and meaningful and personalized uh, for the people that you're dealing with. So definitely a lot of data uh, problems. I, I would say, um, there, uh, you know, in healthcare, uh, it, there, there's a lot of foundational work that's being done, but it's a very solvable, solvable problem because it's been solved in a lot of other industries. When we talk about APIs and standardization, it's not a new concept. Uh, it, but uh, but there's definitely a lot of work that we need to do, especially around fire standards and five servers that we also get from vendors. So uh, lots of work to be done. But the good news is that um, you know we have precedents then and and we we've learned from other industries' mistakes going into the, those areas. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons learned to to uh, draw from there, right? Uh, yeah. Hamanchu, how about how about from the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts side? Are you guys seeing this as a, as, as a foundation for a new approach to your data, or is this like a sidecar for you guys? That is definitely a, a significant contributor to the new foundation. And Jeff, you might find um, some joy in this. A old enterprise architecture friend of mine used to say, the only thing stable about the data management strategy of that organization was that it was in a constant state of flux and change, right? And that that's testimonial to the fact that how critical and important data-driven initiatives and data as an asset itself has been over the years. And what we have been looking at this as is, A, how do we more than meet the mandate or meet the both the letter and the spirit of the mandate and use these opportunities to really invest into the core of what the data management platform needs to be. For example, API application, for example, accessing, landing, ingesting, integrating net new external data, daily to your reference around uh, social determinants of health and other similar data. So it's, it's become both a accelerant, but also a much more uh, pronounced driver of focus in terms of making enterprise level decisions that duly consider data as an asset and the impact of treating it one way or another. I think that to me has been the most pronounced change over the last year, a positive change, change that I and Daily and I'm sure Jeff and others welcome as well is 
you know, the conversation about data isn't just, and then we will go do this in data. It starts from, here's what we need to do because, you know, CMS has put this in the front and center of everything that needs to be, right? The, the, the initiative and the law, the regulations are not about something else and data being a consequence of this. They are about the data in and of itself, right? So it, uh, yeah, that, that's how we're looking today. Interesting. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting because Dahlia, you mentioned, um, you know, engagement, member engagement as a key focus. And I, I have actually, in some of the clients we've talked to, seen that strong connection between what's happening. And obviously it, it makes sense that it would be with the, uh, the interoperability work and how that can start to bridge over into more uh, member engagement type uh, initiatives, whether those are, you know, establishing better uh, visibility in, in, in terms of price transparency and, and cost uh, prediction, or whether it's about uh, helping to select the best uh, providers, or whether it's the, uh, helping to uh, provide a better set of answers to questions about benefits and coverage. There's all different types of, of scenarios there. Are you guys seeing something similar to that? And maybe, Jeff, I could start with you to say, across the industry, are you seeing that connection? And if so, what are the kind of key areas that you know um the the payers can start with around uh member engagement that can really drive the the biggest return so the there's a lot there i mean and i i love dahlia's example of you know if if you're not if you if you call people and you communicate them in a in a in an in, inconsistent let's just say or maybe even insulting way that shows that you haven't got your act together inside uh, it's not just the data, it's the, it's the organization's understanding of the processes of the next best step to work with that customer. And when you open up the lens away from claims and into clinical and then into social determinants and into uh, prediction of health, you all of a sudden now have multiple lenses into the, or into the person that have to be respected. So, uh, you know, that's the cherry on top is if your corporate communications are, abs are, are coordinated in such a way that everybody understands what all the legs are doing, you've probably done it well. Uh, very few, frankly, payers have got to there. Um, it's, it's a very hard problem because these systems were never built, meant to be working together. And so we, you know, us plumbers try to talk about the data rule a lot, but what what you really should need to focus on is the fact that you're going to that the exchanges and with the understanding of the health uh, opportunities that are out there, the health payer opportunities are out there to switch uh, uh, loyalty and uh, great customer service is becoming almost table stakes. You have to really start thinking about those terms. Now I can remember very very recently that the idea of marketing at a health plan at a pair was, you know, let's put the billboards up in October, let's run some commercials in November, and let's call it a day. And they'll come back because everybody comes back. Nobody, everybody re-ups, you know, even systems didn't have an end date on their, uh, on their termination, termination date on their policies because you assume that people were gonna stay. And most was a lot of, a lot more was employer-based uh, and people just didn't leave. Um, it, was, it was very complicated. Once people got into a situation, it was very complicated to understand and switch. And now you're seeing with the rise of the exchanges, the rise of the individual health market, the lowering of the employer health market, uh, you're seeing, you know, 40% of the people out there are now looking for individual insurance and they're willing to switch. They're willing to leave. And therefore you're seeing loyalty, stickiness, all these semi-retail, um, it's not purely retail because retail is a whole, it's a little bit more intrusive than it probably should be in health, but a semi-retail concept of, of loyalty and stickiness to a customer which is really the measure by which we should take these initiatives on. And again, the combination, and the, uh, as I said before, the combination of the, the mandate and an influx of other money of front-facing applications, such as search or, or, or um, aggressive prediction of, of health or prediction of next best step from a marketing or sales perspective or prediction of next best step for a wellness perspective or all these organizational theories of or silos of moving the, the person forward is great but if it's done in a silo you'll insult people eventually and you can't have that so what we're seeing is the 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 front and the back office have come together and we're seeing that synergy and so no matter how you look at it you know notice how we went from interoperability data platforms back to consumer it's all the same stuff the problem is trying to prioritize the money and figure out who's going to win. And we all agree, I think, that the foundation has to be a good base of data. And then you pick your spots. Now, maybe you don't want to 
focus down the tra price transparency um, way because it's a fairly difficult thing to do. Maybe you don't want to focus on um, having the greatest search engine or maybe the greatest directory in the world, but, but maybe you do want to focus on, you know, having a really solid, secure, consent-oriented uh, environment. I mean, so it, it's, it's a function of, you know, can you do everything well? Of course. But in, especially with the medium size and small health plans, there's only so much money to do so much. Um, you have to figure out what, where you want to prioritize and what you want to do. And, but, and, the, and the good news is there's a lot of vendors out there to help uh, try to figure out under this umbrella of customer 360, where to take that money and run with it once you've established foundation of data. But as Himanshu said, we're in the first inning. So that we're, we're still establishing foundational elements. Both of them said that we're establishing foundational elements. Well, think about how far that is from, you know, reinventing price transparency in a company or something like that. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good point. And I mean, so Himanshu, maybe you can comment on this. Like what, what would, how do you prioritize and what would you prioritize as far as making a impactful change on the, um, you know, the member experience side is starting with this data? Yeah, good question. So, you know, I'm, I'm biased in this way to say that, you know, we should continue to make more investments in the data space, but logically at a certain point in time, and I think we are, close enough to that is to say, okay, this is not good enough for us to activate use cases on. And we've done that in COVID times prior to that, you know, tons of good use cases around just point combining the claims, clinical, uh, location, mobility, social determinants, other data to bring together, maybe not a 360, but a 270 degree view of member, right? So we're, we're working our way towards the full 360. My sense is the next big leg up in terms of the impacts of these initiatives and these mandates and these investments are in the areas which are really focused on driving and enabling consumer choice. And, you know, as we're, we're listening in as we were waiting for the webinar to start, you know, the, the music that was playing, there was something in there about tell me lies, tell me painted truths. <laughs> right. So, one of the painted truths of um, healthcare in my experience has been this whole idea of choice. There is choice, but the enablement and the, the ability for a member to really actually actively be able to both make a choice, feel that it's informed and be able to act on it. That's what's been, you know, less than optimized, I will say, right? Maybe even compromised uh, over the years. And that's what these mandates are really effectively targeted towards. So to me, Anywhere where we can engage the consumer in making explicit, clear, informed choices. And by the way, we're not talking about 100% of our population. We know there are members who don't have either the, the access or the knowledge or the time or the sophistication, whatever you might call it, to all be making equal kinds and levels of choice choices. It, but enough of our members to do that, that it starts to create incentives, both for incumbents and new entrants. And then we'll start to see this, um, you know, the, the, the circle run around in, in terms of quality, cost, experience, and equity, which are pillars of our mission at Blue Cross, really start to work in tandem with each other. Today, they do but more of it is driven by us as the payers, the providers, and the member has some element of choice to it. So choice is where I think, and the explicit enablement of choice is where I think is the next big real leg up and opportunity for, for these mandates. And that's interesting. Yeah, I think choice is a huge part of it. In fact, um, I also read an article recently that talked about how few members actually understand their coverage. And I think part of choice is also the transparency and, you know, the explainability of understanding their, you know, what their coverage is and, and what's available to them. And so I, I think the mandate helps on both sides of that, right? Both uh, enabling better visibility, um, but also enabling the, the more detailed levels of, of action against that, that, you know, are very difficult to do otherwise. Dahlia, are you, uh, if you think about your, your biggest candidate for where you can make an impact on top of this data in terms of member engagement, what would you pick? So um, I think that that's, that's a very good question and a, and a very complicated question because I, I can't think, I, I don't think I can pick just one area because I think 
ultimately we have to make progress on, on several areas uh, at the same time. Uh, to Himanshu and, and, and Jeff's um, point around the importance of data and analytics, that, that's really table stakes. I think without having a solid data platform and, and a good foundation for how to use that data, um, a lot of what we try to build on top of it, uh, you know, won't uh, reach its potential. Uh, I think we have a lot of really good relationships with uh, partners uh, that can help us in, in things like natural language uh, processing and understanding and uh, creating personalized experiences. And uh, I think we we uh, figured out uh, in at least in, in a lot of areas how to provide uh, price transparency uh, and consent management. Um, so uh, I think um, personalization and, and choice is definitely a, a good area to focus on. And uh, to Himanshu's point around the sophistication or access to technology or knowledge or time um, uh, is going to be um, really challenging for uh, some of our members, especially when we think about um, our seniors uh, in Medicare, Medicaid programs. Uh, so in that, area we're also really uh thinking about how, simplicity how do you simplify some of the the choices and the plans because sometimes like i can imagine my parents if you put in front of them 22 plans in a certain geography it's really extremely hard for them to make a choice so there's there's the you know you give them a lot of choices on one uh, hand and on, on, on the other hand, the, the, just the, the proliferation of choices becomes very unmanageable for, for, uh, for anybody, let alone seniors, to actually make a choice. Uh, so how do you simplify that so that, that you recommend what would be the most uh, you know, impactful in, in their area? I think that's uh, where the holy grail is. So it's uh, personalized choices for them. Um, and uh, definitely uh, with the use of AI machine learning, uh, we, can, uh, we can provide that from a digital uh, side of things. And I would uh, also think about augmented artificial intelligences, like how do you augment some of our brokers or call center agents with, you know, machine learning, uh, you know, data so that uh, for our seniors, a lot of them still their uh, platform of choice or channel of choice is going to be the phone. So how do you make it so that when they call the agent, the agent also can be able to help them navigate uh, to something that's very workable and, and narrow down the choices for them. So, so simplicity is sometimes genius for them in this space. Um, the other front that I think is going to uh, be coming uh, for us pretty soon is also home care. As you think about the current uh, landscape and you know um, hospitals and, and other uh, facilities that provide care, um, I think there's going to be a lot of focus in the future about how do you also um, get give care in a in a in a home setting uh, so that um, the, our members or patients actually can. Um, get a lot of their preventative and routine things in check so it's so they don't uh, have to go to an ER uh, they don't have to travel to go to a provider more often than they need to and that and, and in this space I think data is going to be a huge enabler as well as uh, machine learning virtual care remote monitoring all of that has to come together to ena enable a, a better home-based experience and I think that's going to be the next frontier for a lot of us. Interesting, yeah. Uh, and Dahlia, you mentioned um, consent management. I know that's been a big part of um, the mandate. It's been a big part of, like, if you think about choice, you know, Hamanshi, you brought up choice and you carried on that theme, Dahlia. I think, you know, consent is a, is a key part of this as well, right? It, when, when you wanna empower the member a big part of this is is making sure that they understand and can provide consent to the data that they need to share and you know that they are able to understand who they've provided consent to 
and then revoke consent if they if they need to. Um, and so I, I know this has been one of the biggest challenges in the uh, in the you know, implementation of the interoperability mandates. What, what is your um, viewpoint, I guess, Manchu, on how important consent management is, and you know what should be you know other payers be thinking about as they're thinking about consent? Uh, number one, I think consent is hugely important, both in and of itself in terms of the permission that it offers, but also as a means of um, educating the member and taking the member down a journey of understanding what data, what is in their data, what are the pros and cons of you know, letting a third party have access to it on their behalf. Um, what if that third party is uh, not able to fully use that data in the way that they say, right? Both from a risk perspective, um, but also from the perspective of, you know, if what if there's potential misuse? The other aspect of consent management is, you know, it is the first step again, back to my theme of choice, because there again, the member's making an explicit choice, whether they are making it directly or someone's giving your example for our senior population, someone's helping them make that that decide that decision and, and that choice. So, you know, there's a lot more that will happen around consent management right now, my sense is, and again, I think rightly so, that uh, most health plans are taking a conservative approach to consent management, even if it may mean that upfront, the experience is clunkier, I'll say, than it will be in its uh, most elevated heightened stance, right? Uh, and I also saw a question online about, you know, managing a patient or consumer's identity. It again goes back to being able to manage consent across a individual's different personas. And then over time, being able to tie those different personas together. Now there's pros and cons there, right? Because the, the more single point of uh, focus that a individual's identity aspects are tied to the riskier the more risk that, that gets inherent in that identity. Uh, but that will open, happen over time. I think at this point in time, it's in, I think my sense is it's more important to have a consent management structure in place that meets all the legal regulatory compliance requirements. Um, and over time, we will, as an industry, mature this to a much stronger consent management, like for example, that has happened in financial services um, and other consumer focused industries and functions. Yeah, I think that's a key point. And I love the way you said, um, you know, the, the member needs to understand what is in their data. It, it's their data, right? And that's one of the things that's really interesting about right. the healthcare industry in general is that I'm not sure that most patients and, and members have really felt like this is their data. And uh, you mentioned the consumer trends that are happening across all industries. If you look at, you know, the What's, what Apple has done and, and what other of the kind of consumer oriented companies have done around um, data and, and the control of consent to different aspects of your data. It's really driven a, a big change. And, and like the fact that I can go and see what app has access to what piece of data from my profile and I can revoke things um, in a very easy way in an intuitive way. I feel like that same kind of thing needs to happen in healthcare. And um, so I love the way you said that, Himanshu. That was it was great. And Jeff, I, I know we want to leave some time for question, but I'd love to get your perspective and what you're seeing on consent management across the industry. It sounds hard, flat out. Um, it's persons, devices, applications all have to be agreeable to the purpose of the data and why it's being asked for and why it's being released. Uh, Americans specifically are fairly. Uh, tight, uptight about holding uh, holding on to their data. If you talk to Canadians, they'll laugh at you and say, you know, you guys are getting less less good healthcare because you guys aren't sharing across the board. But that's who we are. And we, it, as a problem, you have to look at the fact that, you know, look at what we do. Most of the time when you're asking about consent, you're trying to get something else done. You're trying to enroll or you're trying to get to the appointment or you're trying to get them into the hospital. You're not really paying attention to what did I just sign? You know, what did I just do? What did I just click? What did I just didn't read for seven pages of scrolling before I clicked the box? You don't do it. You know, you surrender, you don't consent. And it's a situation where you now also, and I'll take it, go even further. Um, what about delegation? Okay, so I've got a multiple, you know, not only do I have to 
we agree that my data is abused certain ways, but perhaps I want to hand that delegation to my spouse or my lawyer or my caregiver or, you know, there's lots of different, it's a multidimensional problem. You've got different kinds of delegation that can happen. And then you have also different slices of data that you can have. My mental health data, my prescription data, different kinds. So what condition and the purpose of data matches up to what data for who, when, and why? That's why it's hard. Uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, academically, it's a, it's a multidimensional problem. You're going to hear a lot of crawl before you walk, you know, um, and I've written a, a number of reports in the last couple of months about this, about what we have to establish, which is obviously a decent data foundation. And then, and then on top of that, the idea that you have to build the ability to specify your intention very clearly of both requesting and delivering data. And that's what you have here, right? You've loosened the controls. It says, I will allow my data out for a certain reason. And those reasons have to be put in terms that people understand, which are conditions and providers and timeframes and delegation authorities and hierarchies. And so you have to be able to come up with a user interface, which we have not done, that says, let me specify what, when, why, how, and who being devices, people, and applications. And we're not, so we're not even close. Okay, there's, there's gonna be an entire redo of MP identity, MP and identity management systems, uh, uh, encryption and authentication systems, um, API management library interfaces to ensure that data is connected to conditions and use cases and appropriate release. Um, there's going to be audit have to be put in because when I release the data today, it doesn't look like it looks like tomorrow. So it, what I release that day has to be logged and retrievable because when I get sued and I will, I need to be able to show what has been done in the past. So there's a whole bunch of systems out there and frankly, a whole lot of vendor opportunity out there in, in being able to come up with the answer to this extremely hard problem. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I've read some of your papers on this. It's uh, If anybody has a chance, you should go take a look at some of the things Jeff's written. It's very thorough kind of overview of the kinds of things you need to think through. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I think we've got a couple of minutes for a few questions. I, I did see a couple of questions online. I don't. I, I want to be cognizant that there's also a uh, meditation session at the end. So maybe we'll just take a question or two here. Um, let, let's just start here with, with uh, this question about um, patient and consumer identity. And uh, maybe Himanshu, I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but can you talk about patient and consumer identity across all of the, these fire servers representing a multitude of payers and providers and, and how to handle that? How is that being handled? I think so for us, right, we are quite frankly at this stage trying to get a good handle and we think we have it now in terms of how we identify, recognize a individual member. Now, connecting that across different fire instances and payers and providers, and you know, Michael Curry for Blue Cross is the same Michael Curry who goes to see MGB Health System or others. That transition is going to happen over time. And to just point, there will be uh, some walk back and redos um, that we might anticipate and expect. I think that's part of the reason why we will continue to see more conservatism in terms of uh, consent management. And therefore, my sense is the consumer experience upfront not being as optimized as it will be later on. Uh, because to your point, Jeff, you know, when, when you're in the middle of trying to get something done and the thing standing between you and that something is a couple of signatures or clicks, Right, you you just want to get past to the other side and 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 get that done. Uh, so so you know I won't say I have a golden ticket answer for this yet, uh, but it's it's going to continue to evolve. But I think it's important for us not to sort of hold back because we don't have the perfect answer. Not saying that we're doing that, but I think that's always the, the question of the consideration that comes up is is this great? No, if it's good enough, we have to move forward. Good. No, that's a great, great answer. Uh, let me grab another question I, here, I so we can also, kind of. Uh, oh, yeah, I would also add um, that um, some of the um, 
uh, issues that Jeff also alluded to makes it even more complicated in terms of the persona. So in addition to I'm Himan show that I and, and I'm um, uh, providing consent, am I providing that consent as the patient or the caregiver? or as right. uh, part of the plan or, or you know, maybe the provider, uh, because uh, some of, um, when, you, when you log on to the system, you could be also assuming several personas there. And how do you, do you make sure that you provide just enough data to satisfy the persona that you're using at the same time? So it's definitely not uh, an easy problem to solve, but uh, I think, um, as Himanshu indicated, um, we need to make progress and uh, we shouldn't have perfection get in the way of progress, right? So, uh, and, and we're all moving one step at a time here. That's good, I like that. Let's not, let's not try to be perfect up front, but let's just make sure we protect the data first and foremost, and then yep, exactly. and, the, and take the right steps to move it forward. That's great. Um, one more question, let's, let's try one more and then we'll see how far we get on it. So, um, our goal is to maximize the impact we get from our investment, um, find efficiencies and look for cost savings. What do you think are the most impactful use cases to start with for cost savings? So Dahlia, do you wanna maybe take that one? Have you, have you looked at your interoperability um, investments from a cost savings perspective and tried to project out where you, you're expecting to see savings downstream? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we all probably we looked at cost savings and in uh, in terms of also utilization management cost savings. Uh, how do, do we um, uh, close some of the gaps in care, um, the operational gaps in care, as well, you know, that contribute to some of the stars ratings. As well as now, we're looking also at uh, clinical interventions and next best, best action that that's going to uh, help us from a cost saving perspective. But I I think some of what we're doing is also not necessarily gonna result in immediate cost savings, but it's an investment in the future because a person's health and how it changes it doesn't change necessarily, uh, you know, in, in seconds or immediately. Uh, but uh, some of the things that we're doing in terms of prevention uh, will help us uh, save cost and utilization, as well as more importantly, improve people's health down the line. Uh, so I think we looked at it from uh, a lot of different uh, aspects and angles. That's good. So you really did kind of explore that. And I guess you're, you've got a way to kind of measure that as we go forward and and um, see how, how much of that's coming true, I guess, right? Yeah, so some is easier to measure than others, uh, of course. But some of the things that we're investing in uh, in, a, in a future, we know is going to bring cost savings in the future, even if we can't um, monetize the exact value. Uh, you know, to the cent at, at this point, but we know that it's definitely the right thing to do. Right, Hamanshu, same same for you. Any anything to add to that? I think um, I completely agree with um, what Dede you said. I think the one aspect of it which is a cost avoidance aspect, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily about cost that are front and center for us today, but will become more important is, you know, we. We as a system are transitioning to more and more digital care. The cost of quote unquote acquiring a brick and mortar consumer into a digital ecosystem, there is a pretty significant cost to it, not just in terms of the technology aspect, but the adoption aspect. So where interoperability is starting to take on some of that work is by enabling folks in being digital natives or being more comfortable being digital natives, particularly as it comes to their healthcare. So you know, in addition to everything Daria said, I think that's another aspect which is sort of uh, under the radar now, but its impact will become more pronounced. I wouldn't call it a immediate, most highest uh, priority use case that we would be explicitly investing in, but it is one that is we are starting to see, okay, if we do this thing over here, it has an impact on what we are trying to do on the digital care front, for example. Yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting linkage. And I, I have heard other payers uh, having a similar point of view on that. So that's that's good. And Jeff, anything you're seeing outside of that as you talk to the whole payer ecosystem? Yeah, to the last two questions, I would just have everybody remember history. Um, remember, remember how we invented NPI. 
that was to have the identity of the provider established and all the things we had to do to get the NPI established. Now, does that mean we're going to have a universal member ID, a universal person ID? We're all going to be chipped? Uh, you know, I don't know. I think providers are a little bit more uh, willing to have themselves identified so they can get paid as compared to the average member or person be uh, purely identified for their lifetime for corporate reasons that may or may not be uh, very well understood. And also with regard to history, don't forget um, health information exchanges and how every region of the country had health information exchanges and 80% of them are now gone. Mm. They did not have a sustaining business model. They took their government money that they got in the beginning. They established a nice little infrastructure of five or six or seven spokes, um, went on for a couple of years, um, a lot of promise, but there was no sustaining business model. You couldn't get people to pay for usage even at, pay, at a penny a transaction. So you have to look out there and say, okay, hey, you know, well, yes, we can all talk about cost avoidance in the future and we're building infrastructure for the future, but eventually after two or three or four years, somebody's gonna say, when's this future gonna happen? Because we gotta pay the bills and, the light, and we need to figure out our data center and we gotta figure out what we're gonna do for new initiatives. And we gotta figure out how we're gonna do mergers or acquisitions or whatever else we're gonna need money for. And in two or three years, are we going to be able to, all these great things we talk about today, are we still going to be in place to show the, that day that we can actually, you know, at some level, some, some concept of ROI? Now, whether that's an extrapolation of net promoter score or, you know, something that's a little less uh, direct. I mean, it's easy to talk about HEDIS and STARS and macro money and gaps in care, because that's pretty straightforward. You can look at HEDIS and STARS. You can say, we went from four, four to 4.5. This means that's much money. Boom, 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 boom. It's easy. It's not as easy to say, okay, an net promoter score went from 73 to 74, and we spent $10 million to do it. Well, wait a minute, you know, okay, what, or $100 million to do it. What, what exactly was the price of that extra point of people? What was it, you know, if 82% if of the people in this country are, are satisfied with their health plan, which is what I've just been, I, I just heard, 82% of the people are satisfied with their health plan. Now, mostly because they wouldn't know what to do otherwise if they wanted to change. But apparently, there is some satisfaction with your health plan. Event, will this consumerism wave slow down when the money slows up? Because frankly, right now, payers are swimming in money. Um, who knows what's gonna happen on a COVID rebound, but right now we're swimming in money. Um, let's remember history, let's take the long view. And I'm, I agree with my, my peers here that we're gonna, you know, consumerism and, and yes, that note promoter score is worth it because people will switch and people will, you know, and once they do switch, they're gonna shop price, 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 and price usually. And then they learn and then they switch again and things happen. But the idea, the individual market is, is rising and it's real. Medicare Advantage market is rising and it's real. The, the aging of America is real. The retirement of America is real. So the shopping for insurance is going to become more important. And on the edges, talking about personalized benefits, we made a prediction, IDC made a prediction a couple of years ago that said, we're going to move to personalized benefits, meaning that you can pick what benefits you want for you. So Michael Curry wants a, a spa, uh, a grocery, uh, grocery store coupons, maybe some pet insurance. I do want a spa, actually. Thank you. There you go. There you go. That's right. And, <laughs> and maybe he, you know, he doesn't care about maternity benefits, for example, or whatever. And we'll be able to pick what we want. Just like, for example, you look at the auto insurance industry that says, if you put this little thing on your car, we'll uh, cut your rates. We'll, you know, so we're going to get to the point where we're going to, you know, again, are we going to be chipped? I don't think so. But are we going to be able to give up some data? Are you going to be willing enough to give up some different data, not just are you a tobacco user or, or uh, have you seen your PCP this year, but are you willing enough to give up your bone density insects? Are you willing to release that you had a colonoscopy and what its results were? Are you going to give up some more data to get a better price? That's where we're going. Now, think about what I just said from an infrastructure perspective. What kind of product definition systems do you have to build to build one million different products? or three and a half million different products, or however many members Humana has, different products for different people out there. That's what we're moving to. And that's when ultimate choice and personalization comes around. And again, I'll go back to the back office is not ready uh, and the infrastructure necessary. So that's perhaps a way to talk about what are our opportunities here in the provider, product, and consumer areas. If we're building infrastructure, what can we do? Don't just think about what we, what we were stuck in doing what can we do thinking about other industries? That's great. Well, I want to say thank you to everybody here. You guys were fantastic. I, I do want to just make a couple of comments. The, I love the idea that all of you are looking at this as foundational investment. Um, that is exactly what uh, is needed for the industry for us to really move forward and use this as an opportunity. 
Uh, I, I like the points Hamanshu raised around choice and consumerization and how this is representative of that. And, you know, this is really their data, right? And so figuring out how do we drive more uh, engagement and more opportunity and, and transparency around that data. Um, and I'll just, I'll leave it with the, the lesson that you just laid out there. Let's, let's remember the lessons of history, Jeff. I think that's really critical that we don't forget that there's a whole history of, of, of lessons to learn from. And, and we need to make sure as we go forward that we're taking those right steps. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody, uh, your, your perspectives from your organization. So Dahlia and Himanshu and Jeff, thank you for joining today. And, and uh, for the participants, I believe there's a, a little wellness session here. There's gonna be a little bit of a, a meditation session. Um, so hopefully you all get a chance to attend that and be prepared for your next meeting, uh, nice and refreshed. Uh, but I appreciate everybody's time and I look forward to f future discussions between this team. Thank you so much.